huh? As many as expected. Okay, so employees and pro-colleagues. Okay, how many of you prefer to already? For the others, don't freak out. This is not for the exam tomorrow. We just have the two or three review session. Uh, what are we talking about? It's cardiovascular, it's exam three, right? How many of you think, just based starting for this exam, you think that this is going to be the hardest you're going to have based on how they prepare? I think we are going to get more. So I tell you what I, I tell you what I just told you to do, students, right? I'm, I'm pretty. Famous or infamous for writing challenging exams, right? Fine. I don't think I ever wrote such a challenging exam. You better work hard right? <laughs> for this. Yeah. If you don't know it by now, you are I'm pulling you. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's, it's an easy exam. I, I share with what I told some students in my. Uh, I want to share, share with you what I share with some students who asked me in the office hours today. I'll tell you this. I'm not. I want to make sure that you work hard because it's going to be a challenging exam just like all my exams, right? But I'm going to say that. It, in my experience, this is the 20th semester semester I'm teaching this class. It, the third exam, students typically feel they are, this was more than usual just because it's so packed and it's a cardiovascular. And you we just had one lecture about the immune, one class, right? They feel there's so much. It, typically, we do better than any other exam. So the exam is not going to be more difficult. Study well and you prepare for the exam. Don't stress out about this, okay? The other thing, before we start, let's congratulate Lucy for graduating with the highest honors after the presentation this Thursday. Oh. Okay. I'm ready. Shoot. Yes, Marika. Ooh, did I ask that in the practice? Yeah. Okay, so I, you don't need to know this. If you want to, I'll just tell you, the NK cells actually do not bind to MHC, but I'm sorry, you don't need to know this. Practice is, I, always, I don't change the practice every, every semester, and sometimes there's some stuff that I do not cover. So unlike the, which are the counterparts in the adaptive immune system? Unlike the CTL, the NK cells actually find their bad guys by finding those that don't have an MHC. But again, not for the exam. Sorry for that. I know there's a delay between the SA and the AD. Does that mean there's no gap junctions, or what is the actual mechanism that creates a delay? Wonderful question. What are the actual mechanisms that allow us for, allow us for a delay? Okay? You drive you know, on I 40, right? Many drive on I 40, four lanes on each side, tons of cars. You take exit something, 287, right? And you go, and all the cars turn, right? and you go into, there's a state curve, right? So all of them are going into, imagine now a, a local, tiny, rural road over there, right? Not even, not I-40 becoming 15501, but I-40 becoming something small, tiny. What will happen? Jam. Jam, traffic jam is exactly what happens in the AD node. So you get all those signals coming, what happens is that actually in the cells of the AD node, you have gap junctions, but not as many as you have in other cases. So it's time until all those lines move in, and that's the delay. So there are gap junctions between AB and, or SA and AB? Not directly, because they are here and here, but between the cells that connect them, yes. But it's going to be slower. It's a chalky jam. Yes? Okay, so we're going to ask, answer two questions. We're going to repeat the question, but I'm going to answer it in, in, because the, basically two questions. First of all, we talked about the fact that if the SA node is malfunctioning for some reason, the AD node can take over, right? It's the second fastest. So there are two questions. First of all, how does it do it if the SA node did not send the signals? Second of all, we talk about contraction. But let's first answer the first one. How come the AD node can even take over if you didn't get anything from the SA? It's a pacemaker cell. All the yellow labeled cells in the conductive system, all the autolytic cells are pacemakers. Each and every one of them has the potential to dictate 
a pace. The fastest will dictate the first, and that's the SA node. The AV node is the second. And as they go and they continue, we go from the fastest to the slowest, right? So if the SA node is not functioning, the next in line is actually going to be some conductive cells in that area. But let's say all of this part in the HVR, for some reason, doesn't work, the AV are going to take over. But if the SNO doesn't function and all those operating cells are not going to function, then we won't have contraction in the L atria, right? So the ventricles will contract, but how are they going to get the blood? Passive. Passive filling. It's not going to be optimal. It's two thirds, it's wonderful, but it's not enough. This is why we need to take care of that. It's not that you're not going to die in two minutes like when you have a trivial regulation. So all of them have an innovation? Yeah. You mean from the sympathetic SA and AV? The question is about the sympathetic. They're going to work on the SA and the AV. Yes? So just to clarify, you said that you didn't have the SA or the AV in the ventricles will still contract? No, without the SA. If you don't have the AV, someone needs to, if you start too, too late, if you start too late, let's say in the Coffinji fibers, hypothetically you can do that, right? They will start contracting and they will start. But that's going to be so slow that you will not be able to, uh, to supply all the demands, basically, to provide all the demands. AV, SA is around 60 per minute. AV is around 40 per minute. Not perfect, but still can work. It's slower. And again, if the atria don't contract, it's not only slower, but you push less blood because you get less blood. So again, it's far from being optimal. But it means that we can survive, at least in a short term. Yeah. So ventricular fibrillation just means there's no hierarchy outside. Exactly. Ventricular fibrillation is not that the slow one took over. It's just like everyone is going crazy. Everyone is doing, we, we lost the hierarchy. And then there's no contraction because this cell in the ventricle is contracting, and then the other cell in a different part, and then the atria contracts mess. So it wouldn't just be like the AV starts working. Exactly. It's worse than just the AV working. Ventricular fibrillation is the worst for all it means. Um, one of the study guide questions um, is if communication between the SA node and the AV node becomes blocked, which is the most certainly affected? The answer is ventricles will contract at a slower rate. Right. How can you explain what that means exactly? Like the AV will take over. Right. The AV is a pacemaker, but it's, it reaches the threshold a bit slower than the SA. Right. So all the cycle is becoming slower which means the ventricles will contract slower. That's the reason. Is it, is it that they, like when I think of the atria not pumping, I, I still think the ventricles will pump at the same time that they normally would. No, because they will do it now based on the new leader. Okay. And the leader is AV, and the AV, the channels in the AV cells are structured in a way, or in the concentration of the, where we have them, they will just reach the threshold of the crazy, remember the crazy pacemaker potential, they will reach it slower. So you have less uh, slower or lower frequency of action potentials per minute. So it will be slower. Since the ventricles get all their action potentials from the I mean, it's starting from the AV, but eventually going to the pay for the Kinji fibers, everything will be dictated by the AV, which will be slower. So again, we have two issues. One, slower. But second of all, lower volume, because the EDP is going to be smaller, because atria are just passively filling the ventricles. Um, let's say that SA is working, but AV isn't working. Oh, that's a good question. If the AV is completely blocked, someone came and took out the AV, what would happen? Can we tolerate that? Can I say fix some signals? Yes, I cannot. Because we don't have a direct connection, remember, between the entry and the ventricle. Because we want that delay. So it has to go through the AV. And if we remove that part... Now, of course, these are kind of like all the non-conditions that I gave you. It might be that the AV, AV is not a cell. AV is tons of cells. Maybe some of them are not working, but some others work, so it always can be somewhere in between. But that's the basic idea. Yes, Andrew. So if the connection between the SA and the AV were blocked, but both of them were still functioning, would the atria just be contracting significantly faster than the ventricles? Well,
Well, the issue is that if the SA, if the connection was blocked, but the atria will be contracting, you also have connection between the SA and the AV because of the gap junctions between the cardiocytes and the AV. Right? That will compensate. Yes? Um, on the vascular system review guide, there was a question that says anemia is often accompanied by a decrease in blood pressure. Why? Anyone want to suggest an idea? Anemia and blood pressure? Is it a lack of platelets, so therefore lack of volume? Yeah. So basically what we have with anemia, could you repeat that? Anemia would be too? Uh, decrease in blood pressure. Decrease in blood pressure. Because anemia typically is the case when you have less red blood cells. It doesn't have to be the case. It can be a normal number, but just you don't carry oxygen as it should. But in general, when you're talking about less red blood cells, they are the major component of your viscosity that provides viscosity. The greater the viscosity, the greater the resistance. Remember the smoothie versus water that we drink to the straw? So if you have less <laughs> viscosity, you have less resistance, you have less systemic pressure. Can you describe the difference between Frank's Darling's law and Frank's law? Yes. So Frank's Darling's law slash preload and contractility. Frank's Darling's law talks about contractility, right? It talks about this, the heart, the ventricles will contract stronger if we have a stretch, if the preload is increasing, right? But the term contractility that we give as a factor, so we can call contractility, but now we give a different name, we call it contractility, maybe it should have given it a different name, that is at a given preload, so that is beyond the Frank Starling law. Let's say I have heart A and heart heart A and heart B, okay? And I, still, I stretch them to a given stretch, right? I have the same Frank Starling's law, same info, impact, same preload. Now can we change the contractility? The answer is yes, with the factors that determine the contractility that we talked about the nervous system and the endocrine system. It's a bit confusing because again, contractility per se is also affected by the preload but when we say afterload, contractility, preload, that contractility in the middle is a different contractility. It's beyond that. Uh, when we were learning about the muscles, we saw a chart that kind of showed that the more um, distance between the actinomycin, it'll actually decrease the tension that the muscle can create. No, we said that if we, if we, if we uh, stretch the muscle up to a point, we'll get actually the optimal ratio. If you stretch it too much, I mean, I'm bored. that's basically the molecular explanation between the preload stuff. Because what you do, you are stretching the muscle wall. You're not stretching it at the level that they're going to completely touch. You just make it, you're pulling them to a better uh, tension to stretching ratio. Uh, one of the practice exam questions said the blood pressure in the arterioles <coughs> entering the tissue is lower than the one in the large arteries because, and the answer was the longer the blood travels, the more friction it encounters. That's right. So I guess my question was, if you're encountering more friction, your blood pressure is going up, correct? The systemic blood pressure. Right. Yeah. So, but are, so how do we differentiate between local and systemic in the questions and stuff like that. So that's exactly the case. You were distinguishing if I write about the local and the, and the systemic. So read the question again. The blood pressure in the arterioles entering the tissues is lower. So the blood pressure in the arterioles, right. is that local or systemic? That's, that's local. Because the systemic is always the large arteries. I want to bring you back to the graph that we discussed in the beginning. Right? And you said large arteries are just like AR, right? and then going to arterioles, and then going to right capillaries, and so on, and veins. And we said it's fluctuating here, and then it's going to drop like this, right? And we said, wow, arterioles, that's a big dramatic decline, right? But we just said that arterioles are determining, are in, like, increasing, the more friction is increasing, it's increasing the systemic one. So what we see here is not a measurement of the systemic, what we see here is a measurement in each branch of the cardiovascular, the vascular system, I should say. We're measuring the local pressure. That's the pressure in the large arteries. Here is the pressure in the arterioles. Here is the pressure in the capillaries. The pressure in the capillaries will be much lower than the pressure in the large arteries because we have this whole mileage and friction and so on. If I now change the pressure in the arterioles and I decrease 
okay? The local pressure here, because I changed something, the effect on the systemic pressure will be an increase. But there will still be a decrease in the local pressure. So remember, the systemic is what? What's another word to say for systemic pressure? It's not or arterial pressure. It's the pressure here. Well, if I want to be really, really accurate, it's not the pressure in the large arteries. It's going to be the pressure in the large arteries minus, so take away, zero. Why? Because zero at the end, I have the, after the vena cava, I reach the right chamber, it's exactly zero. So it's always a gradient, right? So the systemic pressure is starting point minus end point. Since the end point is zero, I'm saying, instead of me saying all the time, minus zero, minus zero, minus zero, I just call it systemic pressure. So the systemic pressure is the arterial pressure, the nap, that drives the pressure throughout the system. Local pressure is anything downstream specifically to the place. Remember that our goal is to, as much as possible, a resting state to keep a constant, give or take, systemic blood pressure. We don't have any goal to keep a, a, a constant local pressure. Just like we don't, we care about cardiac output and blood flow, they will be pretty constant, but we don't care about the local flow to be the same. If I run, I want more blood coming through my muscles, right? But I'm not gonna eat while I'm running, so I'm okay with the digestive system just, just still getting blood, but not as much as when I'm now about to eat, and after that I need a lot of blood for energy absorption, so I forgot, okay? So Locally, there are different events that take place. We care that the system as a whole will still run. So that we have, we need to have the proper homeostatic following, homeostatic following systemic blood pressure. Um, so, uh, you So an increase in an increase in venous return. I'll just repeat that, make sure we all understand what's the effect on the EDV? Going up or down? Ah, right? More blood is coming, great. Now imagine that we had just the just the EDV thing, nothing else. So if I had now imagine the reservoir, right, the way I start from, the atrial and eventually the ventricles, I have five liters, okay, in case one. And I have a given push, and I'll have, I will push a lot, and I'll, let's say one liter is staying in the SVM. I'm throwing completely different numbers, right? Just to, as an example. Now, in case B, instead of five liters, I have 100 liters, right? Tons of blood came into the ventricle. And I'm pushing exactly the same. Then I will eject more blood, because more I started with. But I'm going to stay with even more, right? Because still, there's a lot. But in our heart, we have a different system. Not only that the EDV increase, but the EDV, EDV also increased to what? Our preload and our ability to contract more forcefully than usual. So I'm starting with a greater initiating pool, starting point, with a pool, a reservoir, a ventricle with more blood. But I'm also doing a better job, more forceful job in ejecting. So I'm actually left with less. Since the ESV, don't forget, ESV is not what we eject, that's slow body. ESV is what is left with. The more I ejected, the less I expected, and that's the ESV. So the increased venous return, increases the EDV, increases the preload, and therefore I will contract more forcefully. So EDV goes up, ESV, what's left, is going to go down. Cardiac output, of course, goes up. Sierra. So is it the case that If everything works well, exactly. Any increase in EDV decreases ESV, not because EDV is just more volume, because EDV has a premium effect. Of course, up to a given point. You can stretch your heart more. So at some point, if you continue to put more blood into the ventricle, you'll be reaching a maximum of stretching the preload. And then the ESV will actually go up because you will continue to eject, but you have more of the space. Rate. You can 
heart rate with parasympathetic, you can increase or decrease? Uh, you can decrease. Decrease. And for contractility, you can increase it with the adrenal medulla and the um, and sympathetic. sympathetic. It's an excellent question. Uh, I don't want to say that it's completely not going to happen, but the main way the parasympathetic will work would be by affecting the heart rate. Okay? It's not that it's not going to have any effect on contractility. The reason why it's mainly sympathetic and not parasympathetic is because the opening of those calcium channels that the sympathetic will do is kind of like an extra what you currently have. You're not going to close the current costume chance that you have with the parasympathetic. Okay? So the main effect is by the sympathetic. It's not true to say that there's no effect, but it's for the sake of the end. Nicole. So the um, parasympathetic doesn't help with vasodilation? Yes, parasympathetic does not help with vasodilation. It's not invading the vessel, the arterioles, just sympathetic. But it will affect the basal dilation by inhibiting the sympathetic. <laughs> if you remember something from your nervous system, especially from the labs, parasympathetic, where is it coming from? You know, if I talk about the nervous system, anatomically wise, where is it coming from? Brain. That's the area of the medulla, the whole area of the brainstem, spinal cord. Where is parasympathetic, where is sympathetic? Oops. <laughs> Cumulative exam, remember final? Both of them from the spinal cord, not exactly. Is the parasympathetic from the cervical and the sacral region? Yeah. Power sympathetic, power sympathetic, and this is the sympathetic, <coughs> the middle part. So, if we want the center of the cardiovascular center is where in the medulla oblongata, right? We don't have sympathetic neurons coming from the medulla oblongata. But we can control with tracks the central part of the, the central part of the spinal cord, so we can inhibit if we want to, or promote, depending, the sympathetic. Okay? So the vagus nerve that starts from here is going to work parasympathetic. It doesn't work sympathetically. But we can affect sympathetic neurons by regulating here, sending IPCs, everything that we learn about. I cannot put you like with the cumulative design anymore, right? <laughs> okay. Yes, Andrew. Why? It's challenging to just guess this. Why? Because you have less blood running from that vessel. At the same time, it's also smaller diameter. So it's initial ratio at the end of the day. But you can think about it. The way it makes me at least I'm feeling confused about that is this is why the reason I gave you the example in the class about the hose that you completely bend. So instead of thinking about partially closing it, just think about it as completely closing it. What would be the pressure? Zero. zero, right? So you completely constrict it, you reach the zero. But you increase the sympathetic one. You increase the downs, the upstream, sorry about it. Yes. Okay, so how does the optimum refractory period in the plateau phase affect, again, I think this, sorry, affects the heart rate, uh, affects an increasing heart rate. Mm -hmm. So let's think about scales, let's think about time, okay? What's with the long absolute refractory period and with the long contraction relaxation cycle that we have in the heart relative to muscle, to cerebral muscle, right? What's the length between starting and relaxing, approximately? 250, let's say 300 milliseconds, right? Now let's talk about heartbeat, normal heartbeat. What is normal heartbeat? 75, let's say 60, right? So 60 beats per, how many beats per second? One. One second, so that means in one second, I have time for three complete contraction relaxation cycles, almost four, right? 
So three to four complete contraction. So if I increase the heart rate, I'm not yet reaching the relax contraction, the twitch, if you will, of the cardiac muscle. I'm not reaching that point. <laughs> Only if I increase the heart rate significantly, I reach that point. And this is why if we go and increase the heart rate significantly, like really significantly, we want to make sure we're still doing a proper refill, and that's why we have the absolute refractory period when we are not going to have the many contractions. But in the resting state, we're not going to reach that point at all. So that's important, I just finished the point, because I was asked by students, wait a second, if we have the absolute refractory period and the long plateau and everything that we discussed, how can the sympathetic nervous system tells the SA node act faster, it can, because there's still a lot of space between the resting state and reaching that boundary that you cannot work faster than that, which is the absolute refractory period. The sympathetic nervous system can say, faster, 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 up to some point, you can't work faster than that, absolute refractory period will block it. Yes. Can you remind how broad volumes are Right, so blood volume, what is the, let's remind ourselves, what is blood pressure, by definition, the blood pressure in our vessels, in our large arteries, what is it? It's the force per unit of area, right? That affects a given, so a force given a specific area, right? So that's a pressure. So if I have the same area, because I didn't change anything with the arteries, and I provide more volume of blood, what is more volume of blood? These are more molecules that exert pressure on the walls, right? So that increases the pressure. If I'm turning up the faucet, if I open the faucet more, more water will run in the system. I will have a greater pressure. So that's how blood volume this is. If I decrease the blood volume, I decrease the systemic pressure. If I increase, I increase that. I want to address a question that some of you asked me, and I, this is confusing, but hopefully now, after we study for the exam and so on, I think it might be clear. I'm going to use this keyboard for that. <laughs> Who wants to tell me? Inducible for Z plus. Inducible, constitutive, or uninducible? I'm serious. Why? <laughs> Lauren, you're, you're starting for two, two. It doesn't matter. It doesn't count. Okay. Constitutive, that's right. Okay. Those who took 202 with me, just so you know, the final 252 also includes some questions from 202. It's like extra super premium. Okay, now I want to ask you something. So this will be representing the faucet, the big, the large arteries, okay? And this going down, and I'll just use this as one of the locals. Okay, local is always higher, lower, lower than the system, right? Pressure is here. Okay, so a point that I want to make, because I think it can be confusing when you think about it. So we said, and hopefully you get it now, that if I am decreasing, let's say I completely raise the pressure here, normally you have pressure coming here, if I'm decreasing, the local pressure by base of constricting, what will happen to the systemic? Increases, right? So if this goes down, I'm writing it A. This is the first event, then B goes up. Right? I'll keep it, I'm not going to erase it, I'm just going to open a new local. Show, any questions about this part? That's important, and hopefully by now, I think we got it, but to make sure I understand. This the credit resistance, the systemic with the peripheral resistance and therefore the systemic. If you guys feel more comfortable with equations, that's going back to the equations and the formula. If you're more like me, kind of like a visual thinker, I'm just thinking, okay, we close this, this means that the pressure here cannot, the CPA cannot move here, so it builds up here. Whatever works for you. Great. A different scenario, okay? I drank more, so I have in, increased blood pressure here. I change the normal conditions. Now I have an increased pressure here. The first event that I do, I increase the pressure here, in this scenario, in the top. What's the if impact on the local pressure here? 
Increase or decrease, guys? Increase. Increase. So if I talk about the effect, the impact of the local over the systemic, they will be opposing each other, right? The opposite. But if I'm talking about changing the systemic, I'm actually doing the same thing for the local because I, there's more blood in the system, therefore more blood to flow from here. This can be really confusing. That's why I did not discuss it at all in the lecture because that would have killed you completely, right? But now when we process and study and so on, it's a good time to mention this. So it's not A will affect B and vice versa. The vice versa doesn't work here because the systemic, increasing systemic will increase the local. We have 25 minutes to spend time with each other, so let's ask questions about the immune system maybe or something different, there we go. Okay, so I, I want, if you get a question like this in the exam, right, you learn with me about the second cube, right? It's not something that's in microbiology, promise, right? So you should expect, if this is a question of if I read this, I would say, what did he mean? He's trying to trick me because we learned about the second cube. Actually, I wasn't even thinking about that. I was thinking basically about, you know, what happens when it gets all the signals. So in this case, what I'm trying to say if there is a question that you're not 100% sure, what did he mean, ask me, okay? Because when I wrote this question, I was thinking just to make sure you know that the, the, the focus was to remember that it's going to plasma cells and memory cells. But then we learned about, at some point about second cue, I'm not gonna think about that in this question, okay? So just make sure you answer. Yes. Um, what are the two signals? What are the two signals? One signal will always be, this is true for B cells, and this is true for CTLs. One signal will come based on the specificity and the specific binding of the cell, T cell receptor in the case of CTL, or in the B cell, how do we call that thing? Antibody, to a specific antigen. So if I'm a B cell, I have my antibody on the membrane, only when this antibody binds to a very specific antigen, that's Q number one. If I'm a CTL, I have my T cell receptor binding to the antigen. Just to remind you, T cells have two arms. One is binding to NHC, one is binding, okay? Now, all, I'm still about to answer the question. I just want to make sure that we're talking about this. All my T cells, my Gilly Shemers T cells, okay? All my CTLs have the same arm that will bind to the NHC one because all my MC1 are the same, right? But the halogen has a whole different arm that will bind to MHC because it's not the same. So this is this, the first part. Now, the second Q comes from where? The helper T cells. And these are cytokines. So the helper T cells also have one arm binding to the MHC, which class? Two. And another arm, the T cell receptor, binding to a given arm specific antigen. Only when it has this binding, it will send the cytokines. The cytokines are the second cube. So these are the B cells, and what you mean? You know, what Nicole was referring to, right? The cytokines are going to be the second cube. One of these cues will not suffice. You need both of them. So the helper T cell doesn't have to bind to the MHC1? It still only has two arms? It cannot. It doesn't know how to bind to the MHC1. Okay. It doesn't have the right arm. If anyone learned about CD4 and CD8, if not, you don't like it, but, yeah. Um, so we talked about how uh, si uh, CTLs also differentiate into effectors and memories. So do they do that once they've been activated by their specific protein, antigen, whatever, and when they get the cytokines? Exactly. But so they kill, when they attach onto the, like, MH1, MHC1 holding that specific antigen, they are gonna kill it. They're gonna kill it only after they get a second cue. Right, so at what point do they differentiate? When they get the cytokines. The differentiate is, doesn't mean that they're gonna become a whole different cell. Right. 
But they said the CTLs cannot start to start secret perforating <coughs> and perforating membranes just around them because that will kill normal cells. So if I'm binding, if I'm CTL and I'm binding right now, then I use this, the antigen, right? I'm still not making it. When I, once I get this, what do the cytokines do? Cytokines are hormones, right? And they will start binding to receptors and start to start signaling the scale like the endocrine system, if you remember. These are hormones, right? And that will start to express performance, the granules of enzymes, the death signal that will tell the, the target to die. So that's the effect of cells. In the B cells, we give it a different name, plasma cell. In the CTLs, we don't give a different name. We just call it effector CTLs. They're just the killing CTLs, if you will. So when do they, so if the effector cells are the ones that kill it, but Only they, after they get the two cues, sidelines. But and they're and also the ones that are activated by the two signals? At which point does the... No, the CTLs, the mature but not yet activated CTLs, right. are going after they're being act activated, yeah. they differentiate into, they become, Okay, right. so divide first of all, yeah. and then again, some of them will be left for memory cells, right. and the rest are differentiating. I'm starting what is differentiating, I'm starting to express different genes and so on of a killing machine, and then they're going to kill the cell. Uh, so the first one doesn't kill the cell that they bind to, they just bind to, just like B cells don't do anything to a cell, right. they just bind to, but then they differentiate into plasma cells that secrete antibodies. Okay. How, how does the T cell bind to the H The same thing, it has a T cell receptor. Antibodies have, uh, sorry, B cells have antibodies. Uh, CTLs and helper T cells have T cell receptors. They again, just like the antibodies, we're starting with genes that because of recombination and stuff that we did not learn, we have almost endless recombination. So each T cell has its own T cell receptor. That's the specificity part. And what do we need to know about the complement system? Just that there's a complement system that helps other components of the system to work. The main reason why I mentioned the complement system is also to make sure that we understand it's not just cells, right? Complement is not a cell, it's just a bunch of proteins. So it's a, a very interesting cascade of events that they do. They just help the innate immune system in so many ways, just making things work better. Right. It, are there specific things we need to know about those? No, only okay. if you take, I assume you guys see microbiology 351. You learn about it, okay, yeah. Even when you go really into the details. Yeah. Um, so, uh, if you get infected, for example, by a virus, that's the antibody plump the virus itself, or does it like plump cells that are infected by the virus? The question is about the B cells, what happens if a virus infects? So, the B cells cannot, I mean, they cannot do a lot of things to the cell itself. Once a cell is infected by a virus, the B cells and the antibodies will be almost meaningless. Okay? We talked about this. This is when you need the CTLs. Okay? The B cells, the B cells though, are still important with virus because they can send antibodies to the soluble particle, the virus itself, which is pretty small, right? And they can deactivate or what have you to some of these individual viruses. Um, you said in class that it's a gene. Very important concept. So, like, okay, so say that there's a new, like, bacteria or something that no one has any resistance to, then, like, if I am exposed to, like, that bacteria, then, like, my body will produce new antibodies. Does that change 